Hello to all the meeps and bubbles. On today's menu we have infinite cheese and volcano taming. And next episode, infinite power. But first we're gonna start off this episode with one of the best exploits ever. Credit goes to Valdemar Svensson, who showed this exploit on his channel. Link in the description and comments below. And he derived it one from data from JS Yoon, who is the Da Vinci of Oxygen Not Included, regarding developing creations. Since I know that you probably can't keep it in your pants until we arrive at a spot in a video where I would normally show this exploit, let me explain what I'm doing here. Mechanical airlocks and probably other doors behave in a way that they are not considered a single object, which means that we can store heat or cold energy in one part of the door, then close the door and transfer it to the other part of the door. And to store and extract this heat or cold energy, we will be using temp shift plates. The temp shift plates are arranged in a way that they can only reach one part of the door, either the lower part of the door or the top part of the door. The only exception that I did here was the top temp shift plate which can reach both parts of the door. Then I added an automation cable, a signal switch and a timer sensor. For the temp shift plates I was using aluminum, but you can probably use anything in your desired temperature range. The automation sensor is there so that the doors automatically open and you can activate the system by deactivating the automation switch because the rest of the automation will be controlled by the timer sensor. You see me preparing the piping for the cooling in the background as well as the mini pump setup that I need to vacuum out that room because you do want your heat or cold transferring doors to be in a vacuum. Now in order for us to create a temperature source that we want to duplicate, I am preparing a thermoregulator that will help us cool down to around minus 220 degrees Celsius the lowermost metal tiles. You can choose for the temperature whatever you want, be it hot or cold, just make sure to choose the appropriate materials and don't freeze or evaporate your gases or liquids. Now that this lower area has been pre-cooled or heated, we can activate the whole system. First we need to set the timer sensor to a value that allows the doors to be stuck in a close and opening loop. With my current PC speed, this is 0.2 and 0.7. I'm not sure if those values may vary for you. Now we are ready to activate the system by deactivating the signal switch. The temperature transfer from the metal block will immediately start and a cold will be pressed by the temp shift plate into the first door, which closes, touches the next temp shift plate, which in itself is transferring the cold to the metal block to the right and the next door, which then is cooling the topmost single metal tile, which is just there to act as a cold buffer. Once those temperatures have evened out, there will be no more heat or cold loss. From now on, you are just duplicating the temperature that a metal block has in this moment in time. This is not such a big deal, I hear you say. Well, take a look at my oxygen production facility. Liquid oxygen, if I might add. Which is cooled down by just a few pre-cooled metal tiles. And now you know why I don't post videos more often. Because I work on weird stuff like this in the background. This is the thing sitting around my testing world and it is at around minus 190 degrees Celsius. Liquefying produces oxygen almost instantly. It is by far not perfect because it produces a lot of ice on the side. But I think it works as a proof of concept. Of course I have a non-industrial more household version of this as well. Arriving back at a let's play what might I be using this powerful exploit for? Cooling loops. Mostly cooling loops. Food, base and more. But how did we get here in the first place? Last episode we ended with storing the whole water planet in this tiny space down here. And today I wanted to solve all of your temperature and in the next episode all of your energy problems. Forever! At least until they fix it. For everything that you have seen we will probably need a lot of materials. Hence it might be time to tame those two volcanoes on Steku's planet. Speaking of Steku's gooey paradise, it seems I have overdone it with the cooling. If you want to follow what I'm doing right now, it will be pretty easy for you to build a double volcano tamer. In this case we have two metal volcanoes that we can inspect relatively safely once we vacuumed out the area. For that I was using two gas pumps and a high pressure valve. Then you could see me open up the cobalt volcano on the top left in the hopes of sealing it up again so I don't have to deal with a hot cobalt. For that I was using two temp shift plates made out of dirt. I am aware that cold should work better for this but I wanted to see what happens if I try to close up the volcano with two sand tiles that will be created. After that I told the dupe to clean up the mess and inspect the volcano. Once that was done, right before it wanted to erupt, I sealed up the room. The volcano erupted, melting the temp shift plates, turning them into sand. But as you have seen, the second sand tile was immediately destroyed, or turned into glass for that matter. So I threw away my initial idea, reopened the volcano room, but this time to the middle, vacuumed it out again, planted piping for the steam turbines, the heavy watt wire, and then dumped some water into the steam chamber so that all the temperatures inside can even out. Then I tried 
try to build a simple conveyor loop with three included order sweepers that can reach the two conveyor loaders leading to a conveyor rail loop that cycles around until a temperature of around 130 degrees is reached. Here you can see an example of that. And once the material has given off enough temperature, it will be dumped outside, right here for the moment. I will probably just delete those tiles and drop it into the water. Let me give you a quick overview of this again. The volcanoes erupt at 2226 degrees Celsius. Where they are different from each other is how much cobalt they drop. The top left one is 6.9 kilograms per second and the down right one is 7.9 kilograms per second, but for a different amount of time. There's liquid on the floor and or steam in the air, which is enough to transfer the heat from the erupting cobalt volcanoes into the surrounding atmosphere, solidifying it in the process. The steam turbines then will take care of the heat. They are cooled by my planet-wide cooling loop, by the way, so external cooling needed in this case. The picked up and rotating metal will stop at 130 degrees and will then be dumped outside of the room. Let's check the temperature sensor. Oh yeah, we can see a common bug here. The material that passed through here was above 1000 degrees Celsius. So it should have been dumped, but it is not. That is the case because the amount of rotating material was super small. In this case, 1430 microgram. This can happen when a volcano erupts and immediately forms small amounts of debris, which can be picked up by the auto sweeper and end up in your conveyor loop. One easy method to take care of those conveyor packages is to just place a conveyor chute anywhere, have it be permanently closed, but once open up every cycle or every few cycles. For that, you could just use a timer sensor, set the red duration to 600 seconds and give the auto sweepers like 20 seconds green time to pick up the freshly dropped debris. But I honestly do not care enough at the moment to do so. But besides that, it is time to bring in a new duplicate. We'll be taking Liam here, who is a pilot and has mole hands. Welcome my very first YouTube member, the stapler gun. Don't be too happy about existing, the dupes are getting treated very badly. I think the long way to the current quarters proves my point. If you wonder how he already got hurt, well, take a look at this hot quarter area right here. As far as your job goes, you will be our digger. And our second amazing dupe will be Squid Cake, an animal lover with an irritable bowel. Hello and welcome to the base, you will be our construction dupe. And if I can remember it because of personal preferences, a mechatronics engineer or pilot in the future. All of those new dupes are hard on our food reserves. That's why the dupes had to harvest our spindly crop food early. Then grab it and transport it over to the living module. Which didn't stop me from bringing in even more dupes into the base. This time, since I couldn't find the correct dupe for Feral Kitten, we will be bringing in another Nazgul as a new delivery dupe. All these dupes should help me construct faster, finish the ladder and digging commands that I had pre-planned with no harm to the duplicates done so that I can finally focus on better living situations. Not like this, what you see right now. Crammed into a tiny sardine can, sleeping on the floor or not sleeping at all. Which brings us to here. Here on the top right corner on full vista, I have planned to build a beautiful living quarter for our duplicants, which should be around 5 dupes at the moment, but I plan to make a living quarter for 6 duplicants. This preparation aside, on Zapiol, our radioactive planet, we did a lot more of digging and preparation than we did on Flodista. All of this nice real estate here will be put to good use when I know exactly what to do with it. Until then, let me show you what we did here. We dug out the whole planet, to the right at least. And now we do have a giant amount of salt water and a little bit of normal water here on Zapiol as well. And you can find the water right above this magma pool here. Maybe we will be using that for something. I also found out that we have two more water producing vents or geysers. In case you didn't know, you can press the P plus zero button to give a priority yellow command to the geysers or volcanoes. Then you can look in the top left corner and see what it is. In our case, a water geyser and a steam vent. Both can be used to produce even more water for this planet. Also, say hey to Echo. Back at Flodista, I encased this cool slush geyser here in a layer of insulated tiles. At the same time, I'm emptying out that room once, so that we don't have mixed liquids in them, but just pure cold polluted water. And for the first buff of energy, you see me building two solar panels on top, which also helps with the emptying task. The living quarters on Flodista will start here on the top right. First I'm gonna place down a little bit of insulation around and then mark a standard 4 tile high room. To the left here I want a few smaller rooms, there can be toilets or recreation rooms in the future and in the middle here will be the transport shaft, which also functions as a great hall hopefully. Then to the right we can plan the bedroom situations, with a lot of decor if I can handle it. Then let me think, the dupes will exhale a lot of CO2. We may be able to use that in a soda fountain that I place to the left and make it a recreation room later. Underneath 
underneath that will be a bathroom. More decoration shouldn't hurt and a light in the bathroom helps the dupes do their business faster. But since I don't want to have the lamp activated all the time, I'm going to automate it with a motion sensor. This is how our lovely dupe quarters look at the moment. I added six bedrooms for the dupes. The left side is still mostly empty though, but I added a payload opener and a wall toilet to the setup, which reminds me of the scrubs episode with the roof toilet. Then I realized that having the solar panels on the floor is a dumb idea and I lifted them up by three tiles, moved the wall toilet and payload opener one tile to the left, cause the toilet's output kept getting blocked and added another recreation room with a card cabinet. Not sure if this decor will be enough. The dupes then finish the construction and our bathroom. Or should I say bathrooms, plural. With all of these basic rooms out of the way, we can now take care of the maintenance. In our case, this will mostly be the exhaled carbon dioxide from the dupes, which I plan on getting rid of by detecting it with a sensor and pumping it into space in order for us to not waste oxygen. I will have two mechanical gas filters included in this setup, helping us to siphon out the clean oxygen and even a little bit of the carbon dioxide so that we can use it in our soda fountain. The main oxygen production for this setup will be on a lower level and the carbon dioxide that we will be using for the soda fountain Fountain will come from this canister filler. One of the patrons that still hasn't gotten a dupe is our lovely Feral Kitten. Feral Kitten wanted a dupe with a skill they can't actually use, which I couldn't really find in all of these cycles, so we will be making you our kitchen menace cook. Feral Kitten, welcome to the base. First you will go to this bedroom here, sleep here and eat here. Then I will make you our official cook, you will get a tiny head and off you go through the radiation and critter infested top of our base, shortly stopping to catch your breath all the way down the ladder for whatever reason. Ah, just to relax, that is a good lazy start for a kitten. Meanwhile on top of the base, parts of the maintenance room have been finished. I even added a telephone so feral kitten doesn't have to run all the way down to the rocket. Then I remembered that it might be a good idea to have access to water and that I still need the carbon dioxide sensor. The gas element sensor is set to carbon dioxide, hooked up to a knot gate and a knot gate to the mini pump. Underneath that I placed the power distribution and power system for our lovely living module. This will produce 2000 kilowatts of power and polluted water as a byproduct. Then we can give Nazgul the dupe number for the electric engineering and the stapler gun will get carrying and carrying too. As for feral kitten, still the designated kitchen menace. And while we are at it, why not create a critter drop off? This one should be shovel range number two, you have seen that in my short videos. Then we just select them in the menu, catch them and drop them here. We fill the right and the left side with above 350 kilograms of any liquid so that the shovels can't traverse it. And while we are building, I added a few more as well as an automatic dispenser, which when faced towards a block can drop an egg on top of the same block. Does not work with material. I almost forgot for us to be able to catch the critter, we will need a rancher. In our case, Squid Cake will be the designated critter handler. For now. So let's see how Squid Cake handles the situation. That's not a critter. But after a good night's sleep, Squid Cake runs past the critters. Okay. Accepting the newly changed job title and changing the head, Squid Cake is hopefully ready to finally catch us a lovely critter, starting with a Sweetle, before stopping in action and running back to the base. Thank you a lot, Squid Cake. After catching their breath, Squid Cake took up the job of wrangling the critters again. Or wrangling space, as you can see here. After wrangling up the cosmic energy, Squid Cake delivered it to the far most left of our tiny free-floating critter setup. Then I wrangled up the rest of the wild shovels, found a few more that were hiding somewhere in the base and had a duplicate deliver them to our ranch. Somewhat at the same time, I copied over the generator setup to one floor below. Here you can have a look at the power distribution of this living module. And underneath the second power generator room, our self-powered oxygen machine for this planet will be added. You can see it here in the area that I marked red. The right part of this is the oxygen production system and the left part is for power, energy and keeps the thing running. The top middle and top left is for temperature management. And now since I also had the idea to use the hydrogen generator room as a temperature control unit as well, I want to fill it with two different liquids, maybe even three. Let's first start with the petroleum. Then after constructing a few more tiles, we can add the polluted water. Once this has been dropped, we can change over to the clear water. Again, after constructing a few more tiles. When this has been finished and the clean water has been dropped, we can close off the room. Even though the air pockets here annoy the heck out of me. But I don't want to spend the time on removing those. 
And now that this room has been closed, we can repeat the same thing for the next room. If you are wondering where the polluted water is coming from, from here. I placed a pitcher pump right next to our cool slush geyser and deconstructed the wall. Then the dupes were picking up the stuff and delivering it. Oh man, what have I gotten myself into? Now I need to explain everything that I built here. Let's start with the oxygen production system here to the right, which will be supplying our living module with around 8 duplicates worth of oxygen, probably a little bit less. Before we can even use it, I need to start up the spawn. We will just need to connect the power cable for that because I already charged up a large battery with a little bit of manual labor. But as you can see on the right, the gas are not in the correct spaces. We do have two tiles of oxygen here that should not be here, meaning I need to vacuum this specific place or the whole thing out before starting up the system again. Vacuuming out a room is exactly what we are doing right now. The oxygen will be transported through these pipes. This here is the area where the oxygen will be cooled in the future. Then the oxygen will be transported further up right through the insulation tiles and dumped in the base. I'm gonna get rid of the hydrogen on the top here. It is the next day and we still haven't vacuumed this out because uh, we ran out of power. So we have a dupe around there again. Now go to dupe number 3 and number 4 for the win. Still no vacuum. Now that we have a vacuum here, we can reactivate our electrolyzer. Hoping that it goes well. I reconnected the cables and deactivated all of the automation sensors which would tell the pumps to activate because I don't want that at the moment. I want to build up pressure. Hydrogen on the top and oxygen below like it should be. Then we can reset this to 1200, this to 900 and then check if this works. I put down a save file just in case. So now only oxygen should go up and hydrogen should go to the left. The hydrogen will then power the hydrogen generator which will keep the self-powered oxygen module running. The oxygen that we send up will end up in our base. It seems like we need to kickstart this one more time, hooking up the power, activating the pumps, activating the electrolyzer, sucking up the hydrogen and the oxygen, transporting the hydrogen to the hydrogen generator, which will produce enough energy to fill the smart battery until a certain level is reached. The battery then will power the electrolyzer set up to the right and only if needed activate the hydrogen generator again. In our case I set it to 95 and 70. And the second thing that can activate our generator is the atmosphere sensor reaching above 1400 gram of hydrogen. This is what I consider a little bit too much pressure in this tile. Activating the hydrogen generator as well to burn off a little bit of the excess hydrogen here. Freeing up space for more hydrogen, meaning the electrolyzer can activate and is no longer overpressured. Then we can cut this and this should run forever as long as we have water. I will quickly check the overlays and then we can keep on going with the next project. The temperature sensor to the left here is just to control how much degrees we do want to have in our battery block. This here to the right is pretty self-explanatory. This will be our energy production system. We will dump a little bit petroleum on the floor, creating a liquid layer and a second layer of polluted water on top, which the mini pump will take care of. The generator will produce 750 grams per second of polluted water and the mini pump can handle 1 kilogram per second and the carbon dioxide will get sucked up by the gas pump. The generator produces 500 grams per second, which is exactly what a gas pump can handle per second. And if you want to take a look at this, this is the power grid at the moment. As far as the piping behind this construction goes, I just tried to squeeze in as much cooling loops as I could, even though we don't use any of those at the moment, but I do want access to different temperatures in the future. Taking a breather from the suffocating presence of all those pipe spaghetti, why don't we tame this beautiful iron volcano on Steku's gooey paradise. By now you should know the drill. Encase everything with the insulation, place a few pumps, create a vacuum, build the steam turbines and research the volcano, enjoy sparkle streaking Steku for a second, then build a conveyor cooling loop with a few auto sweepers, conveyor loaders and conveyor chute output, dump a good amount of water into the room, accidentally break your auto sweeper, order the dupe to dump even more water inside and I should probably deconstruct and reconstruct the auto sweeper because repairing it will be too expensive. Then after reconstructing the auto sweeper, I noticed that the heat transfer from the liquid iron was not enough to kickstart the system properly. So I rearranged the conveyor loop and gave it better priorities with a few bridges. All the tempshift plates in the lower part of this build will help even out the temperature drastically. And while we are at it, I was constructing another tempshift plate right next to the temperature sensor. Happening at the same time, I basically sent over material non-stop to Flodista. That is how we got enough metal for all of our construction errands. If you wanna build this, let me quickly explain what I did here. We have our temperature sensor that checks for the temperature if the metal is cold enough. If it is cold enough, it will activate the shutoff. 
giving the metal another way to go, where it then will be dropped into our cold water. The metal that leaves the room should be at under 130 degrees, because we put that in the conveyor rail thermo sensor below 130. This is now our iron production system. The power for the smaller parts comes from this tiny cable here, which is hooked up to the transformer up here in the base, connected to our battery block, leading to our main power cable, which is connected to all of the steam turbines on this planet, making this old cable obsolete and we can deconstruct it. And now another quick stop at our lovely living quarter, which looks like this at the moment. The dupes are eating in our travel shaft and they are exhaling carbon dioxide. And it is this carbon dioxide that we will be using for the soda fountain. The CO2 is denser than oxygen and will sink down to our maintenance room, where we bottle it up with a canister filler transporting it back up and making soda out of it. Right underneath that is the first bathroom. Hooked up to our water, the excrements will just be dumped to the left. Like our lovely Nazgul the Dupe number 4 is demonstrating at this moment in time. The pee and all the other stuff will accumulate in the tiny room to the left, where a mini pump will take care of it as soon as a certain threshold is reached. The pipe for this is shared with both petroleum generators and it just leads up into space for now. Maybe I will collect it later on somewhere else. Here you can see how they are hooked up to the petroleum generators. Then we do have the arcade cabinet, a few airflow tiles so the carbon dioxide can sink down easier and of course our maintenance room where the dupes can get water and the carbon dioxide accumulates until a certain level. In our case the second most tile from the floor. If CO2 is detected there the mini pump will activate sucking it up and transporting it into the void but only after filtering out all the clean oxygen and filtering out enough carbon dioxide to fill our canister filler. For the sodas, of course. For the dupes to be able to bottle up a little bit of water, I gave them this room here. The bottled water will be used in this water cooler up here. This down here is basically just a liquid vent hooked up to hydro sensor set to below 500 kilograms. So if we don't have enough water, sensor will activate and open the vent. This recreation building in the transport shaft is necessary that we do get the great hall bonus, as you can see here. We do have a great hall in the middle with the absolute maximum room size of 120 tiles and to the right we do have all the bedrooms. To the left you can find recreation rooms and bathrooms alternating. Sadly those rooms down here have no special feature. A very important main thing that is missing from this planet is a very cold infinite food storage. Preferably in a sterile atmosphere. Which is why I wanted to implement a one tile storage in one of the bedrooms. I used the lowest one so the dupes can reach it from anywhere in the living module with the help of the fire pole. Two main things are the problem here. We do not want a sterile atmosphere to escape and we also do not want the cold inside of our living quarters or even worse the heat of the living quarter heating up our infinite food storage. For the cooling loop I will just use a hydrogen loop but in order to get a sterile atmosphere in here it seems I need one more tile which can be achieved by deconstructing the tile right to the conveyor chute. Then a gas bridge and high pressure vent should do the trick. Once those have been constructed the insulation can be expanded and the necessary liquids acquired. You will be needing crude oil and nafta. The only nafta that I have, as far as I remember, is this here on our first planetoid, derived from a few transit tubes melting. Nafta lying around on the main planet isn't helping us in any way, so I had to come up with a tiny setup like this, collect and dump in the nafta, in order to send it over to our flood disturb planet. Once I added the cables and the pipes, the nafta was pumped into the interplanetary launcher and soon after shot to Flodista, where we then could activate the crude oil first, dump it and then place the nafta on top. Just to be sure I don't have to mop up the crude oil from everywhere, I deconstructed the tile first. Now I'm playing the stop and start game to get only a small amount of the crude oil, which I may have managed to do so. Why is it important that we have it this way and not just crude oil and petroleum, even though those wouldn't freeze as well? Well, nafta has a super shitty thermal conductivity, which is exactly what we want for this, because it will help keep the cold where it should be, acting as a liquid insulator, which means I can now finally drop the nafta. And then we should probably take care of the hydrogen, which is why you see me test if those pipe segments are correct. Repeating this, but this time saving a little bit of the hydrogen for later, this should be ready as preparation to prime our infinite food storage the same moment that we drop the nafta, which saves me from having to create a vacuum again and then filling it with hydrogen. I just press all the evil gases out of the new fridge area with the hydrogen that I have accumulated here. And it appears this worked like a charm. We can now deactivate the bottle emptier, deconstruct it, get rid of the tile and mop up all the excess stuff. But we can't reach it at the moment, so we probably need to deconstruct the conveyor chute, replace it with a tile, hope for the best that the nafta will be pressed to the left and not to the right 
and be very happy when exactly that happens. And there was a brief moment where you could also see that we only have hydrogen in there. Now we do want to get rid of all the excess liquid, which we can achieve by deconstructing both of the tiles, therefore tile and a regular tile. Then we can deconstruct the tile that we needed to press the nafta to the left, reconstruct the airflow tile and construct a new tile above the door, so that we will get the visual of the two liquids clinging to the wall. And also replace the conveyor chute. After that I'm going to lock the door so the duplicants can't walk into it, possibly interfering with our liquids. We don't want that. After the tile and the conveyor chute has been built, we get the stacked liquid visuals and can switch over to cooling the thing. Which is why I planned this area down here for the temperature management. Since you have seen most of the cooling exploit, I will just show you how we got there. Like my personal bandana with those cooling blocks here. Getting the petroleum inside of it so that the temperature sensor can pick up the heat transferred by the doors quicker was an absolute nightmare and took forever. And when I finally managed to do so, I forgot a single metal tile block, leading to the temperature in the lower generator room being too hot, destroying a pump, and me having to fix it. So just built this block out of metal. Now we arrived at this point in time, where we started the episode and which will help us finally create a working infinite food storage, and giving us the cooling power for everything else. This thermoregulator loop will be responsible for the initial cooling of the metal block down below. We filled it with hydrogen of course, and all of those liquid pipes can be used later for cooling loops with different temperatures. The thermoregulator will definitely overheat if we don't have any medium or atmosphere to transfer some cold from the doors into the room. But I don't feel like creating a vacuum again, so I'm filling the room with petroleum and with water, which both will freeze and solidify later on, creating a vacuum in the room. Then we can use the high pressure valve that I placed in and fill the room with hydrogen, which is able to withstand the very cold temperatures. In our case, Case, I aimed for minus 220 degrees Celsius, which I did not fully achieve or use, but we can always change the temperature later on. We just have to cool down the main cooling block further with the help of our thermoregulator. Then I opened all the doors in the room so we can vacuum it out, with hopefully no gas pockets left anywhere. You can imagine that this took a while, so I didn't check in every few seconds. A few cycles later we had a vacuum, and overall 9 cycles later we even reached the fitting temperature that we need. The hydrogen for the cooling loops was just siphoned off from our swamp setup. One little bit at a time. The cooling block area is being looped with hydrogen as well as our food storage. Leaving that aside for a second, where do we even get our petroleum from to power our petroleum generators or at least one of them? How about a little bit of petroleum duplication? But as you can see the setup is slightly larger than our cool slush geyser setup above, so let's place it somewhere else, left to the geyser for example. This should be the size that we need. Then we can skip the building process of the outlines, I think everybody knows how to do that. Then I put in a few gas pumps to create a vacuum and a few liquid meter valves and liquid valves that allow us to drop the correct amount of liquids later on. I did not start a duplication but I already put in a little bit of petroleum and started the vacuum process. After the vacuum was achieved we can get rid of all the unnecessary machinery and piping. And I think I'm adding a second pump, cleaning up the floor as well. Closing off the room and adding automation switches so I can control the pumps. Once this has been done we can close off the room, add the final mesh tile underneath the central liquid vent and then start the duplication process. We do that by dropping 0.06 kilograms of water to the left and to the right of the central liquid vent. The original design and values are by Math Mannequin. Link in the description. This works with a lot of different liquids, but you need to understand the liquid values. This value is chosen because the liquid can only spread exactly one tile from the drop point without being able to flow to the third tile. Now we wait for the petroleum to accumulate until it drops over the first tile, getting sucked up by our pumps. Meanwhile our cooling area reached minus 220 degrees celsius and our cooling block here to the right got a little bit too cold, almost minus 60 degrees freezing the petroleum. I had to fix that off screen, took a while, but we achieved a minus 43 degrees infinite food storage, keeping it cold by this hydrogen loop. And this conveyor chute will allow us to feed in food in the future, automatically. Meanwhile we created enough petroleum for it to spill over. Now we can activate the first pump, which is responsible for powering the petroleum generators. The petroleum is being sucked up, transported over, now we can follow our piping, where the bridge priority will tell them to fill the first generator first and use the excess petroleum for the second generator. Then I noticed our mini pumps activating, which we don't want. I want them to activate when the hydro sensor reaches above 10 kg and the gas pump should only activate when the atmos sensor shows above 4 kg per tile. The top room will not be controlled, I can just let it over pressure by deconnecting our pump, wait a little while and then reconnect it. Once we overpressure the room, there will always be enough gas inside of the room and it will never draw a vacuum. After that I'm siphoning off a little bit more hydrogen to fill our food cooling loop. 
Once that has been achieved, we can cut the hydrogen input. To finish off this episode, I want the dupes to have a nicer surrounding area, meaning I want to spam pixel packs everywhere. And while doing that, clear up common misconception. Subscribing on YouTube is free and doesn't bind you to anything. It will just increase the chance of YouTube showing you the video of the channel you subscribe to. I know this sounds like common knowledge, but I myself, a long time ago, was under the same misconception. And now you can enjoy a nice cool one with all the Nazgul the dupes. Follow them around the base with the save file I put in the description. Watch Squid Cake happily munch with the balloon body next to the mess table. And hopefully leave a like for all of the hard work that I put into this video. Love you guys and Luma out. If you liked this video, then the next video on the screen might also pique your interest. Have a great day and I see you there.